The Tom Woods Show, episode 2039. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey folks, Tom Woods here. Don't forget, you can get one of my books in audiobook format for free. So that includes my book, Real Descent, which is narrated by me. My New York Times bestseller, Meltdown on the Financial Crisis of 2008, featuring a foreword by Ron Paul nullification, and others. Just head over to tomwoodsaudio.com, sign up for Audible, and if you decide you don't want Audible, you get to keep the free audiobook they give you anyway. tomwoodsaudio.com. Hey, everybody, Tom Woods here. We're wrapping up Michael Malice Week by thinking about the, frankly, the paradigm shift that has to go on in your head to think about the kinds of issues we've been talking about this week productively. Instead of assuming that there is a class of people with your best interests at heart, whom we vote for, who will put things right and who will provide various services for us and that we are helpless to provide these services on our own. We are helpless to provide them on our own. We need them provided coercively by the political class in Washington, D.C., because these are the very best people we have. Okay, maybe I'm caricaturing the view, but... That is the implication, isn't it? I mean, why else would we have a system like this if it weren't for the idea that there are certain people who are specially suited to provide indispensable services to us and we select those people and these people as selflessly as possible. I mean, I don't know. I can't even continue, right? We have to think differently and we have to look at the objections we have to such a system and think about them very seriously and consider if they are truly insuperable or if there may simply be another way of thinking about these issues. Let me start with a little story about a dinner I attended last week. I was having dinner, Michael, with somebody, I don't know if you've met him, but you know who he is, and he's pretty well known in our movement. He's a minarchist. He's a really hardcore minarchist, though. Like It's absolute bare minimum, and I could not make him budge on that. He was surprised to learn at dinner the other night that I was not a minarchist like him and that I didn't believe in the state at all. And I said, every bit of analysis you have for the reasons you don't want the state involved in everything else applies also to the things where you do want it involved. And I said, what you're basically saying is we don't need the state at all except for the provision of the most important things in society. I don't think I buy that. And I said, do you really think that if we had private security that it wouldn't work? And then he kind of admitted, no, nah, I think that would probably work. He said, let me tell you my main reasons for not being wait, an wait, anarchist. Can I make a point here? Because oh, please, yeah, say anything you want. Jump yeah, right in. The private security one is a lot easier, I think, nowadays to get people to wrap their heads around than it was maybe a few years ago. New York City and other cities had a taxi cab monopoly, right? You had to have a medallion in order to drive a taxi cab. There's something that was a function of the state. As a result of this, understandably, medallions were enormously valuable because there was a finite amount of them. It wasn't like a driver's license. Like there's, there was a closed shop, uh, finite amount and huge demand. And you know, a lot of cabbies would just you know sell theirs and appreciate in value, so on and so forth. And then Uber came along, right, and Lyft and and other such venues. It's easy for people to wrap their heads around. Okay, we've gone from having the government have a monopoly in terms of cabs. And somehow it's in retrospect, it's hard to make the argument that this is the only way to do it, that it has to be a government monopoly of cab drivers. But then now it's just like, okay, when I need this service, I hit this app and the people come to me. And sometimes they're rapists. That's happened. That's true. And in those cases, which are outliers, they're arrested and so on and so forth. Now there's mechanisms for that. The drivers have cameras inside and so on and so forth. There's a button if you feel unsafe in your Uber. So there's been mechanisms from within the app to address this very serious concern that people understandably have. You're going into a stranger's car. Who is this person? Am I putting myself in danger? Or are they going to be put in danger? Of course, many of the drivers themselves have been assaulted or or, or something like that. But this conversion from the cab driver monopoly to Uber is something everyone has experienced and can understand. So to have the difference between, okay, I need security. Something's, there's a trespasser. Someone's in my house. 
that it has to be when I hit this button, 911, it has to be the cops, a government monopoly, as opposed to, let's say, we need to get them to anarchism, but let's say, okay, someone who's licensed in firearms and you pay some fee and they show up and if you blah, 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 can you wrap your head around that? In that case, even if they think it's a bad idea, they certainly can't say it's utopian. Right, right, right. I think a lot of it, it's a kind of lazy thinking that people have. You know, Rothbard used to say that if if the state always provided shoes and then yeah. somebody came along and said, we got to privatize that, people would think that was crazy. But now that we've we've lived with private shoes, for, and, and the thing is, the arguments they'd make against it would be so dumb. It would be like, well, then people would be producing shoes where one shoe would be size three and one would be size four and we wouldn't have regularity. And, and But see, nobody would want to buy those shoes. So why right. would the company do, well, you're naive if you, no, I'm not. The company is profit seeking. Why would it do something stupid like that? Right, right. So right. it's frustrating. So I want to actually ask you then, as long as we're talking about this. Well, no, you're finishing your thought about you having dinner with the minarchist. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Oh, sorry. Okay. I want to run by you what his yeah, objections yeah. were. So one of them was we need freeways. And he said, okay. you can't get a freeway without the use of eminent domain. Now, by the way, I will post also at tomwoods.com slash 2039. I'll post an article that Bruce Benson wrote. He's from, I think, Florida State. And he has an article from the Independent Review called The Mythology of Holdout as a Justification for Eminent Domain and Public Provision of of Roads. Yeah. So I'm going to link to that at tomwoods.com slash 2039. But so he, he was saying that we need to have that to be able to get from one place to another. And so I came back and said, all right, well, let's imagine, let's stipulate that you're right, that it's really, really difficult to build these sorts of roads. But see, in my world, you'd have no income tax, no drug war, no surveillance. You'd basically just be left alone, do what you want. Isn't that an exchange for less convenient roads? Wouldn't you take that? And he says, okay, but in my minarchist system, I wouldn't have any of those things either. I already don't have any of those things. Now, I could have argued with him, but your minarchist system won't stay minarchist. There's no reason to think that it would. But he was focused entirely on freeways. And what he was saying was, he said, Let me give you another example. He said, everybody brings up Somalia. He said, well, in Somalia, during the stateless period, if you wanted to get from the airport to the capital, you know how many times you would be stopped and required to pay something? Eight or nine. He says, now, you need the state to stop that kind of piracy. Oh, good. Are you serious? Yeah, so that was was it. And and so it was, primarily, it was roads, and it was these types of large-scale road-building projects. But we, we have that now in the sense of easy pass. On government-built roads, though. No, but what I'm saying is you could very easily have the alternative that even in Somalia, like they don't have to literally be stopping you. If you have the pass, you pay. If you don't have the pass, you don't pay. Yeah, okay. That's true. That's true. To me, it boils down to, since I don't see any evidence, I don't see the, how you get to, we give the state a monopoly on the power to tax and to initiate aggression I don't see how you get from that to, and then it stays like this forever, where all they're providing is police and courts yeah, and it, the military. It, I don't see how that would stay that way. And then, then here's another thing he said. He said, look, if you go into a hotel or you go to the mall, when you get to the mall, as you're walking in, you are implicitly accepting all their rules. You know, that you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't solicit, you can't throw gum on the ground, whatever. You acknowledge all that as you go in. How is that yeah. any different? from people saying in a government, we're all getting together and deciding that we're going to establish this government and make some rules for anybody who enters. Isn't that exactly the same as people entering the mall? And I said, the difference is the mall owner owns the mall. These people do not own the land mass of the United States. And if they did, if you're a Lockean, as you claim to be, explain to me how they homesteaded it. So now what would you say in that situation? And also explain how do I leave the mall? If, yeah. you, had a, if you had a mall owner that said, okay, here in our mall, you have to wear an orange shirt. That's not even that crazy. There's certain places you have to wear a certain wardrobe. Like in the, in the what was it, the Harvard Club or the Yale Club, you have to wear a jacket. Yeah. That's fine. And once you step foot in our mall, you're not allowed to leave under any circumstances without, or without paying an exorbitant fee. That's a very different situation. And this is going to carry over to your grandkids. What? Well, and I said to him, look at the situation we're in right now where there are plenty of people who cannot leave their countries. Tell an Australian, hey, well, if you don't like the rules, you can leave. You can. And he said, well, I'm against that. I'm sure you are. 
But that didn't answer your that didn't answer the concern. Right, right. I'm 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 sure it's great consolation to them that this yeah. person is against it. But that's one of the things that can happen. It's like, yeah, we, I want minarchism. I want the government to stay small. I'm like, yeah, but the government definitely is going to get bigger because the people who are watching it stay small are the ones who are growing it. Well, I'm against that. Th- that's nice. Yeah, I know, but that <laughs> doesn't resolve the problem. Yeah, you're being against it doesn't actually change anything. Right. So, so that was one thing. Another thing was, wow, under the Articles of Confederation, there was nothing theoretically stopping the states from imposing restrictions on each other in terms of trade and, and stuff. And, you know, imposing, you know, boundaries or, or impenetrable state lines or whatever, keeping people out or keeping goods out. And so I reminded him that in, in Rhode Island, the governor did try to do that during COVID to keep people from other states out of there. But he said that what we needed was the Constitution that forced there to be a free trade zone in the U.S. And otherwise, there, there wouldn't have been. And I tried to say kind of a Rothbardian point, that the smaller the unit is, the more absurd it's going to be when they try to be autarkic. Yes. Because if, you're, if your street t- tries to produce everything, they're going to immediately understand it would be better for us to trade because we can't produce really anything. And so I said, eventually people will understand that for their own well-being, they're going to want to trade with the outside world. And I said, how about Hong Kong? What, no one in, in Rhode Island likes oranges? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Ever? Yeah. Lemons? But then maybe I could also say this, though. Again, I could say, let's stipulate for the sake of argument that you're right, that if there weren't some large-scale unit in charge forcing open these trade barriers, then all these stupid idiots would be protectionists forever. Okay, but then let's both acknowledge that there is no perfect world we can live in. But also, how is that incompatible with his minarchism? Well, that's another thing, because what you could also say is, according to you, then we need a world government. But also because if your metaphor is the mall, the mall is a closed system. Oh, and but see, that's another, that's another thing. He also said that a homeowner's association is not really distinguishable from a government. Oh, jeez. Yeah. My doorman is basically a senator. That's just logic. <laughs> no, but that's basically what they're – that's really what they're – this is the one argument against anarchy. There's some arguments that I think are very cogent and yeah. very thought out and very reasonable. And then some arguments that are like, I think you're wrong, but I can't prove it because we haven't seen it play out. Very fair. But it's sometimes it's hard to reverse engineer the criticism. The claim is if there was an anarchist area, right, it would immediately become invaded by China, right? right. I don't, right. I still don't understand how the argument is if let's suppose Vermont, you know, was allowed to secede from the states and became anarchist, an anarchist area, then the next day it's the, red flag of China's over Montpellier. I don't understand how they're making that leap, number one. But when you point out there are many countries on earth right now, right now, who have no military, why aren't they being invaded by China? And the point they make is, well, correctly, you know, they're under the nuclear umbrella or they've got America looking out for their interests. It's like, okay, you can't say that just because America is looking out to make sure China doesn't invade, let's suppose, Liechtenstein or whatever. That's not the case, literally. But that somehow America is the government of Liechtenstein because my bodyguard isn't my boss. My bodyguard is the one taking orders from me. Yes, exactly right. So if someone is providing a service, how are you making the leap that that person is in charge of you? Is the mailman my boss? Is the farmer my boss? They basically make the case that it's not anarchism if a government exists anywhere on earth, which is like saying, well, capitalism hasn't been tried because once there was the USSR or communism didn't work because America existed. What? Yeah. Okay, so I got him to concede that on security, he could understand how security services might be able to be provided privately. So, okay. But a lot of people, I think, do find that difficult. And in the anarchist handbook, that's the portion from the Tannehill's book, Lyndon Morris Tannehill, their book, The Market for Liberty, which is a, a somewhat overlooked book because everybody goes immediately to Rothbard. Nothing right. wrong with that. But The Market for Liberty or to is Friedman. Gr- no, they go to, I think David Friedman broke it down much more than Rothbard did. Oh, yeah. And there's, there's David Friedman also. But in terms of the nuts and bolts of how 
certain things that we associate with the state might occur without it. Oh, for it's sure. It's a very worthwhile book. And so you've got a section there on how this would all work. Because I, I guess the idea that people have in their mind is, you know, somebody comes in and steals something from my house and I have no way to get that back unless I, what am I supposed to do, go, go follow him with a gun? Or then if we do have a private legal system, then maybe he subscribes to a different service than I do. And, and how do we decide which judge we appear in front of? And I mean, there are responses to this. In fact, I really like Randy Barnett's book, The, oh gosh, is it called The Structure of Liberty? I'll look it up. But at the end of that book, Barnett goes through, he's a professor at BU. Oh, no, no, it's Georgetown now. I can't remember. But anyway, Barnett goes through like a thought experiment as to what it would look like in a polycentric legal order. Is what He doesn't want to say anarchy because that's not fashionable in, in academia. So he calls it a polycentric legal order. What would happen if somebody wrongs somebody else? What incentive would exist for companies to want to cooperate with each other? rather than just go to war with each other in the streets. But, that, but that's, an, let me interrupt, because that, that's a really crazy one, because it's like, oh, if you have private security, then I'm going to call my private security company and tell them kill Tom Woods. And since they're automatons, apparently, they're going to go do it. That's not how it works, because right now, if me and you got in a car accident and we have differing car insurances, and I tell my car insurance company, don't you pay Tom's company, I'm completely in the right, and Tom's a jerk, they're going to be like, cool story, bro. And they're going to negotiate with your company directly. So what does this look like? I mean, do I carry... And again, we're speculating, of course, but I think it's still useful to speculate, even though we haven't necessarily had it. No, but do you not agree that that argument that anyone will be able to call their security firm and order hits on other people is just an absurd criticism of the system? Yes, it is. Okay. <laughs> yes, it is. And, and of course... Right now, we have a lot of private security. We have more private security than we have police right. in the U.S. And it's often been said by libertarians that if you're walking around Disney World, you feel 100% safe. You do not feel like a gunfight is about to break out at any moment. And yet, the police presence at Disney World is invisible. You just don't see anybody there. It's invisible. Somehow, they are providing you seamless security and it's private. And likewise, when I go into the mall, my first thought is not, I'm probably going to get mugged here. That's not my first thought. Yeah. This idea, this Hobbesian, Lord of the Flies vision that man is inherently murderous and evil is simply and demonstrably untrue because if that were the case, we'd all be dead. I don't know how many cops there are. There's in terms of population, it's a very small number. So if human beings are by and large murderous by their nature, here's another example you don't think in terms of murder. Every one of us has had opportunities when we're at the supermarket to steal a candy bar or to steal a small item. It never enters our head. And we'd be able to get away with it. And we know we'd be able to get away with it because that's not how people are. Yeah. And also the, the other thing is people aren't comfortable with... You know, if there's like a, a, a child being savagely beaten on the street, you know, in the presence of the state, we're kind of trained to look the other way because there's consequences. But the natural instinct isn't, well, too bad, kiddo. Right. No, it's not. It's not. All right, everybody, I keep reminding you that it's New Year's resolution time. And that's because Old Woods here wants to improve your life. And so if you haven't given Skillshare a world, why not take me up on my offer of a free month of access to thousands and thousands of classes? that can introduce you to or make you better at photography, music, fine art, film and video, including learning how to do indie film, freelance and entrepreneurship, marketing, business analytics, web development, you name it. Start 2022 learning something new, acquiring a new passion, or taking your existing passion to the next level. I personally have used it for strictly business classes, which I like because all the classes I've taken have been about an hour long. No fluff, right to the point. I have a daughter who's interested in costume design. I know nothing about this. Martina Floor, though, has a class called Be Your Own Boss, Strategies for Launching Your Creative Career. That's the kind of thing we're delving into over here in the Woods household these days. These are classes built around your schedule, short and to the point. You get access to an amazing, supportive community. You're going to love it. So explore your creativity at Skillshare.com Woods, where our listeners get a one-month free trial. That's one month free at Skillshare.com Woods. You're obviously very fond of Ayn Rand, and we've talked about her here on the show. But she's not an anarchist. So no. how did you 
make that leap? Uh, I used my reason. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think that's probably what Roy Childs tried to say. Yeah, like her, I think you and I talked about this with Yaron Brook and Lex Friedman's podcast. Her like so-called rhetorical question, dismissal of private security is really one of the dumbest things she's ever said. Because when you have this question that you present as unanswerable, even if there's some answers, it makes you look stupid, right? Even the answers aren't 100% compelling. So the point she made is, you know, let's suppose I am a homeowner and I think there's a burglar or a neighbor who has an issue and they have a dispute and one calls one defense agency and one calls the other. You know, what happens when they show up at each other's doors? You tell me. Or, you know, when Rothbard was discussing and she's like, you mean like civil war? And it's like, as much of an incentive as there is for the company to have a good relationship with its customers, there is a much bigger incentive for these companies to have the market be well-regulated, not regulated in the government sense, but meaning well-adjusted and stable. This is why we have things like rent-seeking. This is why corporations lobby. They like things to be predictable and in their favor in their own terms. They don't want things to explode because it makes them look bad. They makes, you know, soccer moms feel very unsafe. And then we have this right now. You know, if you have some issue and you have the state police and the feds, sure, sometimes they butt heads and they despise each other and it becomes a pissing contest, but they're not shooting each other. Indeed. And again, if this thinking were true, you would need to have a world government because right. all the various countries of the world are in a state of anarchy vis-a-vis each other. We're in a state of anarchy vis-a-vis us in Zimbabwe. There is no final authority arbiter above us. And yet somehow we we interact okay with Zimbabwe. Now, at the same time, I don't want to give the impression that believing in anarchism relies on having an excessively naive view of human nature, that this would be a, quote, utopia, or you could solve all crime, or or that all people are basically good. You know, there Wait, is. Can, a, can I say one thing? That's the thing I love. What? what? If your anarchism is such a utopia, how come you admit there would still be problems? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know it. Exactly. exactly. Well, well, let's see. Well, let's go back and check you, which one of us used the word utopia. You in the mean beginning. under your anarchist utopia, people would still sometimes get sick? I can't, yeah. I can't subscribe to that system. I'm yeah. going to stick with the current system. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You exactly. mean sometimes people would have breakups and they wouldn't hug their kids? It's so weird. The thing is, the key thing to bear in mind is that we know, as Hans Hoppe would say, that we know what the effects of monopolies are. That the price of a service goes up, the quality of it goes down, there's no competition. It's unresponsive to consumer demand or complaints or concerns. And now think about all the various things we have that are government provided. And that is exactly the case. Are you really, really super duper impressed with the security services? Suppose you lived in New York City this past year or Portland or even just an ordinary town. Are you super, super impressed with the security services you're getting? And if something is stolen from you, you're confident that it'll be returned and that if you have to use the state's courts, that that'll go really smoothly. And there's no way you could improve on that. Could these not be the effects of monopoly? And you may say, but I don't see how we could have other than a monopoly. Okay, that's why we have books like The Anarchist Handbook, or we have many episodes of The Tom Woods Show to fill in those gaps. But you've got to at least start thinking that way. If not now, when? Yeah, do you need a government monopoly on food? Yeah, food's even more important, right? It's the most important thing, more important than security. Even if somebody's chasing me, I can at least be eating an apple. Or I could get a gun. Yeah, Yeah, and defend myself, whereas there's no way to defend myself against hunger except with food. Right. And somehow, we are all alive, not starving. All right, did you arrange the book in like an order, like I want people to go like this, or is it like- No, it's chronological. Oh, of course, I'm looking at it right now, of course, because there's Hasna still alive toward the end, and Rothbard, and okay, because I didn't know all the dates on the- No, actually, the authors get smarter as the book proceeds. Oh, because at the very end, it's Michael Malice. Oh, there you, well, you ruined the ending, Tom. <laughs> I ruined the ending. Next time. I ruined the ending. So we didn't actually name more than a handful of them, but would you mind just as we wrap up saying, uh, because you do have the audiobook version available now, there are going to be some of the names of people reading the different chapters that oh. will be familiar. 
Oh, that's that's great. Let me do that right now. Let me pull it up so I don't miss anybody. So this was a big treat. So Arthur Herman, who's a historian, have you had Arthur on? No, but I know you love him. Oh God, he's the best. So I had him read William Godwin's essay, and Godwin, you know, this is from like the late 1700s, I believe. He just eviscerates the social contract, and he's just like, this is just a nonsensical non-concept. So he did a great job there. Good. Max Stirner, who is very idiosyncratic, to put it mildly, lots of wordplay, and it's hard to follow his train of thought. Ethan Suplee, who's a great actor, did that one, and he actually made him coherent. Proudhon, which was um, you know, Memoirs of a Revolutionist, of course, had Tim Poole read that. We discussed earlier that Herbert Spencer, who coined the term Survival of the Fittest, was read by Chris Williamson. David Petrusha, Petrusha I keep, I'm sorry, David, uh, he's another historian. Just his books on presidential elections of uh, 1968, 1920, TR's Last War. He's just a man. I'm reading his book. It's coming out next year called Man of the Hour about the 1936 presidential election. And as I'm reading it, I'm like, I hope, I wonder if FDR is going to pull it off. And it's just like, that just speaks to the guy's skill that you're reading this book about election 100 years ago and you don't know what's going to happen. So he read Josiah Warren, who was really one of these as you know, Tom, as a historian, 19th century America was a very weird place. We think now America's weird, but there have been like all these little, you know, intentional communities and you know, just weird little cults. And Josiah Warren was certainly one of those. Uh, Mikhail Bakunin, who was Marx's big rival, kind of the major anarcho-communist, I thought it'd be appropriate to have Carol and his denunciation of Marx. I thought it'd be appropriate to have Carol Markowitz, who like me is a former refugee from the Soviet Union, to read that. And like you, a refugee from New York City. I just had her on the show. Oh, she she moved to Florida? Yeah, she's in the process now. She just, even though she loved it oh, just so like we did, that. she decided enough was enough. She had to go. I'm so happy to hear that. She's, oh, I adore that woman. Just, just a real sweetheart. Yeah. I thought, and I'm sure you'd agree, now he doesn't identify as black and he is Jamaican, but to have a black person read Lysander Spooner being a big abolitionist, Camille Foster, I thought, it would have made Lysander Spooner proud. And Camille, yeah. of course, is an anarchist. So I love that. Yeah, I thought that was great. Johan Most, who did the essay about how to make dynamite. I originally had Cody Wilson, but I couldn't get a hold of him. So as a, sorry, Curtis, but Curtis Yarvin mentions Moldbug, who's also a bit of a revolutionary. He read Johan Most. I'd read my favorite essay, Lewis Ling. Maybe we should have gotten someone with a deeper voice, but I love that essay. Benjamin Tucker had this piece. He's the publisher of Liberty, which was a big major periodical in the end of the 1800s and early 1900s. He sets out the difference between socialism and anarchism. So I thought Dave Rubin, who has so many varied guests in his show, would be a good read for that one. Peter Kropotkin, his book is called The Conquest of Bread in you know, Anarcho-Communism. I thought it'd be kind of tongue-in-cheek to have Yanmi Park, who is a North Korean refugee, you know, advocate for communism on those terms. Leo Tolstoy, who's one of the great writers of all time. People don't realize he was an anarchist. Buck Sexton has one of the greatest voices ever. So to have his rarefied voice to do Tolstoy, I think did Tolstoy justice. Maj Toure, have you had Maj on? I have. I mean, how can you not adore him? You know, he's a calls himself a solutionary and he's, you know, very skeptical of the legal order, to put it mildly. To have him read Alexander Berkman's argument against prisons, uh, I thought was great. Valterine yeah. Declare, when she had anarchism and American traditions. Adrian Curry, who is the winner of America's Next Top Model. And, you know, she bleeds red, white, and blue. To have her read it, I was really proud of that. I, I'm sure Valterine would be happy to have her legacy carried on like that. Michaela Peterson, I had her read Emma Goldman. I knew that would upset some people, but that's okay. You and I discussed how I had Lauren Chen do the dynamite chapter. For the Tannehills, one of my closest friends, Bridget Fetisi, because Bridget very much is kind of often flummoxed by the culture war and like is just baffled by all the nonsense coming out from what she would say is both sides. So to have her be the one to sit down and explain how anarchism would work in practice, I thought would be very funny. I had you, of course, do Rothbard, which left David Friedman for Dave Smith. And then for John Hasness, who's an attorney, of course, Ron Coleman is also prominent, very pro-liberty attorney. And I, then I thought this was also kind of smart. I was going to read my own chapter. I'm like, wait a minute, why am I doing that? 
everyone else is getting someone to read it. So Lex Friedman, my buddy, did me the solid of reading my chapter. Well, that is really great. So you you yourself didn't read your own chapter. So you didn't, did you not read anything in this book? Well, I read the Lewis Ling. Oh, the, oh, the Lewis Ling. And I read the introductory it's chapter, yeah. Okay. Okay, fair enough. But I love that the Michael Malice chapter is not read by Michael Malice. Yeah, I, I'm like, this. That, that, that was, I thought that was clever on my part. So you have both anarchisthandbook.com and anarchistaudiobook.com? Correct. Okay, so we'll have that all set up at tomwoods.com slash 2039. And uh, we don't know when we're going to get the next Michael Malice book, but do you feel like it's the best and or most important you've done? I don't know about the best because... Dear Reader was really an accomplishment. Well, that is true, especially in somebody else's voice like that. And especially when you're trying to condense, you know, 60 years of Martian history and make it coherent. That was a project and a half. Yeah. No so doubt. I wouldn't, I know this is, is in terms of just technical skill, this is anywhere close to that. But I think this is the book that, I mean, I always try to push myself, right? So I think this is the book that's really going to have the biggest impact of all my books, The White Pill. Well, we're looking forward to that. But in the meantime, in order to be in the Cool People Club, but again, remember, <laughs> plenty of people, we're very liberal in admitting people to this club. Plenty of uncool people are in it as well. Make sure and get your copy of The Anarchist Handbook linked at tomwoods.com slash 2039. Thanks, Michael. I appreciate your time this week. Always a pleasure, Tom. All right, folks, that's going to do it for this week. Pick up the Anarchist Handbook. I've got it linked to tomwoods.com slash 2039. You can get the audiobook version for free, and Michael still gets his royalty at tomwoodsaudio.com. You just sign up for Audible, get your free audiobook, and then if you don't want to stick with Audible, you don't have to. You can just quit, and they let you keep the free audiobook. So everybody's happy. I'm happy. Malice is happy. You're happy. Everybody's happy. So tomwoodsaudio.com is where to go for that. I'll see you all next week. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of the Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.